Good afternoon, everyone. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Agre. He's the second director of the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute, succeeding founder director Diane E. Griffin, who remains as chair of the Department of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology. Dr. Agre received his bachelor's in chemistry from Osberg College in 1970 and his MD from Johns Hopkins in 1974, following an internal medicine residency at Case Western Reserve and a Huonc Fellowship at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Dr. Agre returned to Johns Hopkins as a postdoctoral fellow in cell biology. Dr. Agre joined the faculty in 1984 and has spent most of his professional life at Hopkins School of Medicine, leaving in 2005 to go to become Vice Chancellor for Science and Technology at Duke University Medical Center. His return to Hopkins in 2008 gives Dr. Agre the opportunity to concentrate on an area in which he has always been interested, the problem of disease in the developing world. Dr. Agri's research in red blood cell biochemistry led to the first known membrane defects in congenital hemolytic anemias and produced the first isolation of Rh blood group antigens. In 1992, his laboratory became widely recognized for discovering the aquaporins, a family of water channel proteins found throughout nature and responsible for numerous physiological processes in humans, including kidney concentration as well as secretion of spinal fluid, aqueous humors, tears, sweat, and release of glycerol from fat. Aquaporins have been implicated in multiple clinical disorders, including fluid retention, bedwetting, brain edema, cataracts, heat prostration, and obesity. Water transport and lower organisms, microbes, and plants also depend upon aquaporins. For this work, Dr. Agre shared the 2003 Nobel Prize in Chemistry with Roderick McKinnon of Rockefeller University. Not long after receiving the Nobel Prize, Dr. Agre was awarded the JHMRI pilot grant to extend his studies of aquaporins to malaria, addressing the question of whether or not aquaporins could be exploited as a means of treating or preventing the disease. Initial encouraging results have led to an NIH grant and a focus on malaria as the primary area of study in Dr. Agre's laboratory. As president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Dr. Agre led science and diplomacy missions to Cuba, North Korea, and Myanmar, Burma. His honors include election to the National Academy of Sciences in 2000, the Institute of Medicine in 2005, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2003, and the American Philosophical Society in 2004. He has also received honorary doctorates from universities in Denmark, Genmar Japan, Norway, Greece, Mexico, Hungary, Poland, and the United States. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Agre. Well, good afternoon. It's uh, fun to see so many friends and uh, to be amongst you. And I'm particularly thrilled to be invited by the APSA, the students. And that's what we live for, really. And so I've decided to focus the talk rather than on the nitty gritty of what's going on in the laboratory right now in Baltimore, but upon uh, another issue related to our careers, and that's the international side of science. When you think about it, what is there that's more international than what we do as life scientists? Our colleagues are all around the world. We're in touch with them all of the time. The diseases cross borders so fast. It's really a special opportunity to reach out and bring uh, friendships amongst nations. So I'm going to talk about some of our work, but focusing more upon the people and where they're from than on the technical side. This poll by the Zogby pollsters in 2004 represents a problem that we have in the United States. We actually care what other countries think about us, but they don't always think the best. Five, this is now one year after the invasion of Iraq, five moderate Islamic countries were polled for their feelings about the United States in general. I'll just point at this side since there are more people over here. In general, they had very little favorable response and a large unfavorable response. I guess they don't like our government, they don't like our economy, maybe they don't like our arrogance. But when polled, the same people were polled for their impressions of the United States science and technology, a sea change, a favorability. They like microelectronics, pharmaceutical development, agricultural science, life sciences. And because they like these activities, I think they like us. And with that in mind, I'm going to tell you about my Facebook of science. So science is done by young people. This was, this was me 44 years ago, hard to imagine. 
full head of hair, the knee, knee arti articular cartilage was intact. <clears throat> I was accepted to Johns Hopkins to study medicine, which was my dream, because I wanted to get involved in global health issues. It really wasn't such a trendy topic 44 years ago. I guess our major thoughts as university students in the 60s and 70s was how to avoid getting our butts kicked in Vietnam. But there were people doing global health, and it was really a nice opportunity. And so I headed east to Johns Hopkins by heading west, spending the better part of a year traveling throughout East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. And I arrived at Hopkins with the idea I would do some research related to cholera, a horrific diarrheal disease sweeping through South Asia and Southeast Asia in the 1960s and 70s, killing tens of thousands of small children and infants. And at Hopkins, there was a nucleus of cholera workers, Dr. Carpenter, who was here, Dr. Greeno, Dr. Sack. And my job as a student was to isolate the toxin from the Escherich E. coli, the, the E. coli variant of cholera. And set about doing this and ended up in the laboratory of Pedro Quatrocasas, a former member of this organization, a bright young scientist who was probably the first to use affinity chromatography in biological systems. And as a student in Pedro's lab, it was like landing in the land of Oz. It was so magical, and in large part because the techniques were simple but elegant, and the people were fascinating. Now, Pedro and Gianfredo Puca, shown here, his friend Gianfredo, an Italian movie star, a downhill ski racer, a millionaire, decided he would solve the most important clinical problem faced by any Italian man, and that's the molecular basis of femininity. Duo Medline, Puca Sica Nola Bresciani, 1970, Nature, Isolation of the Estrogen Receptor by Affinity Chromatography. I just felt this was the most exciting thing I could possibly do, although I have to say the rest of the lab was a bit less photogenic. <laughs> but it was totally international. Now, this was before women emerged in science in large numbers, so it's an all-male group. And based on how we dressed, no respectable woman would probably want to join us. <laughs> but shown here is a Polish snake collector, a French psychiatrist, a Canadian road scholar, a big wave surfer from Hawaii, all at work in the laboratories. And people came from all different backgrounds, even adversarial countries. Shown in this slide are two laughing young men. Nothing remarkable about the picture. But you might be interested, on the left is Naji Sahyun, a graduate of American University of Beirut, Palestinian, who was raised with hatred in his heart towards Israel and a suspicion that American Jews were Zionists, his enemies. And on the right is Marvin Ira Siegel, friendly, roly-poly, jocular, son of an Orthodox rabbi from Brooklyn, New York. And Nar Marvin and Naji worked together and became the best of friends for the rest of their lives. I think there are very few places where things like that can happen, where the humanity overcomes the prejudices and the misinformation. Well, I'm going to skip ahead a few decades and talk about what we did in the laboratory. Water, global water issues are in the press all the time. Water also is very important in biology. We, as life scientists, all know that two-thirds of our body mass is water. And I was never focusing upon that, but by sheer serendip, we discovered a protein that turned out to be interesting. And what I had not thought about is the problems that physiologists have been considering for a century of how does water cross the cell membrane? How is it we can secrete and reabsorb spinal fluid with great precision, aqueous humor with precision, humidify our airways, concentrate our urine? Physiologists knew that there was a problem here with membrane water permeability but it was unexplained. And by sheer serendip, we isolated a protein, and with the help of others, we figured out a possible function of it as a water channel. And shown in this very simple experiment, two frog eggs, oocytes a millimeter in diameter. On the left is a control oocyte, on the right an oocyte expressing the complementary RNA for this new protein. In isotonic saline, transferred to distilled water, kapow, osmotic swelling, explosion. Very simple experiment, caused much jubilation in our laboratory. 
uh, in fact, Greg Preston, whose picture I'm showing here, I took, he was the postdoc who did the early studies. I took this picture of him two years after our original report. He was still celebrating. <laughs> and I guess we should have celebrated even more because there was so much interest from other laboratories around the country, around the planet, working in great precision on important problems of renal concentration mechanisms. So we realized quickly that if we were going to continue on this project, we are going to have to team up with others. And this is where the international cascade of science gets very rich. We are each individually limited in our scientific repertoire. But when you include the ideas, the technologies existing in the laboratories of our colleagues around the world, we have a formidable force working for us. So one of our first projects was to solve the structure. Now, I'm a hematologist, or maybe a dropout hematologist. I have no business solving structures of molecules. But these two gentlemen, with whom we worked, allowed us to get the high-resolution structure. Yoshi Nori Fujiyoshi on your left in Kyoto, Andreas Engel at the Biocentrum, Basel on the right. Atomic resolution, allowing us to really understand how water and water alone can cross the membranes with great rapidity. Now, I'm going to sprint through the science, just focusing on the Facebook. There were, were it was work in multiple laboratories around the, the country to isolate homologs. There are 13 human homologs to the aquaporins, as we call them, water channels, formed of two subsets. Those in blue here represent those that are water selective, and those in yellow are water and glycerol selective. And we have some of each, and they play individual functions. And each one of these, CDNAs was a story of a young scientist, many from the United States and from other countries as well. We teamed up with Søren Nielsen from the University of Aarhus in Denmark to locate with precision the presence of the aquaporin 1 protein in a number of tissues, focusing first on kidney, where the proximal nephron contains an abundance of aquaporin 1, explaining the constitu constitutive water permeability. Aquaporin 2 cloned by homology from by Sai Sasaki and his team in Tokyo, present in the collecting duct, the vasopressin-regulated water permeability. And being a physician scientist, like almost everyone here, we're interested in what goes wrong with these proteins in human disease. And by teaming up with an international group of blood bankers in Bristol, England, we identified individuals who had lacked a Colton blood group antigen, which we had shown as the surface locus coincided with the aquaporin-1 gene. So shown in the photograph here in the center, with, with permission, if there are any HIPAA, HIPAA police, we have her permission, is a retired school teacher from France who looks well, feels well, but she has a knockout in both alleles. What would this result in? And of course, I was confident this was going to be a severe, interesting, fascinating, devastating phenotype. And she felt fine. But that's where clinical medicine enters the research field. Because shown on the far right of this photograph was a postdoc. Now his, he's the executive vice dean of Johns Hopkins Medicine. It's Landon King, who did precise phenotyping and found a very interesting phenotype that when thirsted, all of us concentrate our urine up to about 1,000 milliosmolar. But these individuals are stuck at about 280 to 400 milliosmolar. They can't concentrate. And with free access to fluids and air conditioning, there's no major consequence. Of course, the aquaporin-2 knockouts were identified in humans by our friends in the Netherlands, and they are much more severely affected. So again, I'm sprinting through the science. Masato Yasui, a postdoc from Tokyo, now the chairman of pharmacology at Keio University. He came over for a few years and worked on a number of projects, including the aquaporin-0, which is expressed in lens phenotype is cataract. Ole Petter Otterson from the University of Oslo, a very eminent neuroscientist, led us to the aquaporin-4, which is present in brain, at the astroglial end feet surrounding capillaries. This is precisely where fluid enters the brain and leaves the brain and is, was uh, implicated in brain edema. <clears throat> and his student, Mahmoud Amiri, made some very important observations. Now, you probably recognize, even though those of you who are not from Minnesota, that Mahmoud Amiri is not a typical Norwegian name. <laughs> Mahmoud started his research career as a refugee 
in a camp in Pakistan. His family had fled Iran at the time of the mullahs. Given the opportunity by the Norwegian social services to go to high school where he excelled, he went to the University of Oslo Medical School. He's now a leading European neuroscientist. And what Mahmoud found is that in some situations, the lack of acroporin-4 due to mislocalization or genetic knockout, some situations it's del deleterious. Knockout animals and humans, well, actually, I misspoke. There are no humans known yet with acroporin-4 gene deletions. But the animals are vulnerable to epileptic seizures. But in the setting of defined brain injury, which is shown here, middle cerebral artery occlusion followed by reperfusion. The wild type animals, the normal mice, sustain larger brain damage than the mutant animals. Reproduced in multiple laboratories around the world, showing that pharmaceutical, pharm pharmacologic inhibitors or mislocators could have clinical applications in the prevention or treatment of brain edema. Surabhi Raina from Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi came across. She worked on the acroporin-5, the salivary sweat gland acroporin. The acroglyceroporins are present in a number of tissues, acroglyceroporin-3 in skin, the basal level in particular. Now, it didn't take long for this location to get the interest of the, of the beauty industry. Executives from Christian Dior joined us one summer. I don't know about your labs, but we're not frequently visited by Christian Dior executives. <laughs> and, and they had a, a mission, so to speak. They invited me to lecture in Paris and wanted to give me some big grants. I was a little bit suspicious. And of course, it had something to do with the introduction of a, com of a product called Hydraction Skin Cream. Now, I have to tell you, I didn't accept any of the Grants. I have no financial ties to Christian Dior, although there are plenty of days I wonder if that was the right decision. <laughs> Their chemists have identified some small molecules that lead to subtle increase in the expression of the acroglyceroporin-3 in skin, particularly sun-exposed skin of Asian women. It has something to do with the beauty market. And this was the back cover of the Marie Claire Beauty magazine, which I borrowed from the Charles de Gaulle Airport Business Lounge. And those of you in the front can see it's pretty bold rhetoric here. Spectacular results, profound hydration, and what's this? The Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And I showed this to my mother back in Minnesota. Mom was a farm girl. She never went to college. She saw this, she smiled, says, Peter, I think you're finally doing something useful. <laughs> well, our mothers know us better than we know ourselves. We'll get back to the useful business in a minute. Acroglyceroporin-7 in fat, the release of glycerol during profound exercise or starvation. Acroglyceroporin-9 in liver for glycerol uptake to re regenerate glucose levels during fasting and starvation. Also turns out to be the pathway for arsenic excretion from the liver. Arsenic is a huge problem still in the developing world. Eastern India and Bangladesh where the surface waters are contaminated with Vibrio cholera, the groundwaters tapped by small tube wells tragically contain large amounts of arsenic. Of course, the provision of pure drinking water is the protection, but I think it explains the presence of the protein. So a very special morning in my life, just over 10 years ago, early in the morning, a phone call, Swedish accent on the other end, telling me this was an important phone call from Stockholm for Professor Peter Agri. Are you Professor Agri? I said, I, I sure am, and they shared the good news. And I was particularly delighted to know that I would share the, reward, the award with Roderick McKinnon. We'd never collaborated, but Rod worked on the structure of ion channels, and we had the water, so we shared the award. And by the time we actually, after the phone call, I was sprinted for the shower. They said there'll be a press conference in 10 minutes. My wife. Mary called my mother back in Minnesota to give the good news, and always a little suspicious of this highfalutin professionalism. She thought for a moment, said, Mary, that's, that's very nice, but tell Peter not to let this go to his head. <laughs> it's, it's the useful thing. But I got to the, the lab a little late that morning. It had gone to the heads of these young people, and a really international group in the lab, and that's true of probably all of our labs. 
kids from kids, young people from all around the world who came. And they were on their third bottle of champagne by the time I arrived. <laughs> so there's something I have to say, as wonderful as the work in the Acapurans, and we're still doing some work, there's something about the original motion, motives of getting involved in global health that I always wanted to pursue. And by working on Acapurans in Vibrio cholera and in malaria, we decided to make a transition. And so I was offered the directorship of the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute, which is a wonderful organization made possible by an anonymous donor. He's no longer anonymous. It's Mayor Michael Bloomberg. And we have an institute in sub-Saharan Africa where we're doing wonderful, wonderful activities that are turning out to be useful. So I'm going to go over this quickly and talk about some science diplomacy. There's a problem in the third world with infectious disease, and Dr. Fauci will be speaking tonight. It cannot be understated the importance to these developing countries and to ourselves. Malaria affects particularly the young in sub-Saharan Africa, children like these boys who are playing outside of a research station in southern Zambia. They can be protected from getting malaria, but efforts are, and investments need to be made, and they are being made, but it's not always effective. We hear of the statistics, the death toll, 600,000 deaths per year, down from a million, that's good. But we don't hear in the death statistics, the survival statistics, about those who survive and never recover. This youngster brought near death to the field hospital in southern Zambia where Philip Tuma, the, the gentleman whose face you see on the right, he's a Hopkins trained pediatrician who spent his entire career as a missionary doctor in southern Zambia. Saved the child's life, but he's never recovered from the cerebral malaria. He's left with cortical blindness. Imagine how devastating a handicap like that would be anywhere, much less the third world. And so here's the logo from uh, one of our vehicles. And here's, here's part of the team. Phil and I are there. The gentleman to my right, my left, your right, blue shirt, I'll try to point it, is our scientific director, Sungana Marakura, an Oxford-trained Zimbabwean scientist who's leading efforts which are having very interesting scientific outcomes and some practical outcomes. For example, by tracking the, the disease and looking for the non-symptomatic non carriers and treating them aggressively, the prevalence in this one region of Macha, Macha region of southern Zambia, the prevalence has been knocked down by 98%. Still present, but at a much lower level. But we know what will happen if the efforts stop. The parasite will come right back. And they don't live right outside of the hospital usually. They're in the back country. There are no road maps for most of sub-Saharan Africa. Here's the trail leading to one domicile, and it looks pretty easy. This is the beginning of the rainy season. By the end of the rainy season, the grass is two meters tall. And that's where wonderful people working as subsistence farmers, toiling as hard as they can to support themselves and their families. And things may be all right, even though they're living on one or two dollars a day per person, until someone gets malaria. So the field team at work here, looking for carrier states, here, here's a family. They, they, they're not very used to having photographs taken, but they're very grateful for this work. And of course, their lives are hard using farm implementation, which was abandoned well over a century ago, just to survive. And everybody works. The children work, carrying the maize to the village to be ground. But they also know how to have fun. There's a wonderful community there. And, and the notion that life is not taken so seriously or considered so special is, is a farce. Our experiences show that, in fact, these people love their children. They adore their children. Those are their future. Her book is upside down. It says, school is cool. Now, we're presently in the laboratory working on mosquito water channels, Anopheles gambiae. The Anopheles mosquitoes are the most dangerous animals in the world. They don't respect borders. The colonial bridge here separating Zambia on the left from Zimbabwe on the right provides no barrier for mosquitoes. 
and the deployment of public health facilities and resources will determine whether malaria comes back or stays gone. Zambia is doing a good job, a liberal democracy, the liberation of Africa, Kenneth Kaunda. Zambia was the former colony of northern Rhodesia. Southern Rhodesia became Zimbabwe after a, 10 years of ultra-apartheid racist government, a civil war, the election of Robert Mugabe, and now 35 years of financial and, and, and economic chaos has led to the reemergence of malaria. So we have three stations here where we're working. Macha in the bottom left on the border of uh, Botswana and Zimbabwe, Mutasa on the border of Ma Mozambique in the lower right, and Chilengi on the border of Congo. And we're starting to make entries into Congo, which has a huge malaria burden. Congo, Democratic Republic of the Congo is as big as the eastern United States with 85 million people with a horrendous malaria burden. It'll keep coming back unless we take care of the problem everywhere. So this work is funded by the National Institutes of Health through an International Center of Excellence grant, which we're allowed to work in these countries. And there are nine other centers around the world. So here's, here's President Mugabe, 35 years in office. It's, it's time for a change. But we're not there as agents of change or, or instigators of government overthrow. We're there as scientists. We work with whomever we have to work. And Zimbabwe is a beautiful country with much richness. This is a Tia state in the eastern highlands. Wonderful people. Everything to be looked forward to, except for the problems with malaria and other infectious diseases. This gentleman in particular, they have wonderful names. Those of you who have been to Zimbabwe, love more, pray more, give more. This man's name is Never. I said, Never is an unusual name. He says, it's a shortened form of Nevermore. <laughs> so there has to be a story. He says, yes, he was the ninth child, child born. His mother said, Nevermore. <laughs> so the public health and clinics in rural Zimbabwe are there, but they need refurbishment. But they have wonderful staff working their hearts out. This team is on duty 24-7, 365. The lady in the center in the pink outfit, I asked her how long it had been since she had a day off. She said, she said 1993. <laughs> so we don't have to start over. We have to reprogram with organization, because every day the clinic is filled with mothers bringing in their children sick with malaria. And here's Singano back in Harare. He's just relocated to re run their malaria efforts. So I'm going to close in the last five minutes and 10 seconds here by talking about some science diplomacy, which is a spin-off of what we do. It's an extracurricular activity. I was president of the AAAS when the program, the Center for Science Diplomacy, was started. And we've led a series of science visits, just scientists to scientists, no politics, Invariably, the security agencies of the United States want to know what we saw, which is nothing strategic. But I'm just going to talk about two. I won't talk about the trips to Myanmar, Tunisia, Lebanon, Iran. I'll talk about Cuba and North Korea. And we were just in Cuba last week. We've been there five times now. And probably quite a few of you have been to Cuba. The Helms-Burton embargo is still in place, but the interpretation by the executive offices allows scientific and cultural exchanges, no tourism, so we can go there for scientific and clinical purposes. And of course, there are a lot of reminders of the revolution and the old cars are there. The tourism industry and the cigar industry, I guess, drive the economy. I, I didn't smoke that, I have to tell you. <laughs> and where there's been investment, the architecture is gorgeous. And where there's been no investment, it's, it's falling apart. But in spite of the economic problems with the collapse of the Soviet Union, Cuban science has continued focusing upon prevention of disease, vaccine development, public health. Every child in Cuba is born in hospital. And these are two of the directors, sort of the old bulls of science here, the head of the Biotechnology Institute and the head of the Finley Vaccine Institute. But there's still an error that is pervading Cuba from the regime and a reciprocal hostility here in the United States. I spent an evening with Fidel Castro and his family. His, his son is a scientist, I'll tell you. And he had some very interesting things to say about the reasons for the revolution. And one of the points he wanted to make was the need for health care 
No one in pre-revolutionary Cuba was seen by a doctor without paying money. Castro's father was a wealthy landowner. His mother was the maid. He was illegitimate. So he grew up in the village and in the villa. And so it was, a, I think, that experience that caused him to focus on the development of health care in Cuba. And so even an aging dictator and an aging scientist have some common ground. I think that's what we should focus on. I lectured at the University of Havana. And I've lectured to a lot of students, but I never had a reception like this. <laughs> These young people are gifted chemistry students. They want to come to the United States. They want to do science. They don't have the opportunities to work in labs in Cuba. They're bright. They're motivated. They are not communists. They're our friends. In closing, I'll talk just briefly about North Korea, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Here's our scientific team. We've, we've made two visits now. It's like the twilight zone. It looks real, but there's something that's not real about it. Where are the people? And of course, it's run by the Kim regime, a vicious, vicious regime, now the third generation since this picture was taken. The, the Kim Jong-il has passed on. His son, Kim Jong-un, is, the, is the, the leader. And there's a lot of propaganda. Work hard for the country. No one dares to step out of out of, out of line. But in the great people's reading hall, what is on display but copies of Science Magazine? Bob, I bet they're reading your papers in North Korea. And they have science. It's applied science. It's probably rudimentary by what we're used to. They're focusing upon improved agricultural output because they can't feed their people. It's a big, it's a big problem. There is an English language university in North Korea, the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology, was a gift of a wealthy businessman born in Korea. But it's not exactly what we call a party school, <laughs> unless you're talking about the Communist Party. They sing songs of patriotism on the way to class, and they sit there at attention. I, I started my first lecture there with my best joke. And these young people understand English. No one laughed. <laughs> then I explained, that was a joke. That was funny. They burst into laughter. They have to have permission to laugh because they're being observed. If you look over the backs of these young people, security personnel watching, listening, always, always concerned that something might be said that's improper. So this is my last slide. This is Ri Hong, the head of the International Division of the State Academy of Science. And I have a wonderful story I'll tell you if you want some time. I'm out of time now. But his grandson has a very interesting view of the United States. I gave him a box of a carton of granola bars, saw Dr. Hong a few, a few months later, and asked him how his grandson was. He said, he's fine. Send some more granola bars. <laughs> so in closing, Mandarin for crisis. And in Korean, it's, it's very similar, Wei Ji way, a time of danger, whether it's pestilence or warfare, there's a lot of danger in the world. But gee, the time of opportunity. And science, I think, brings the opportunities to us. So looking back at the uh, later parts of my career, the lab was great, the discoveries were great, but the people we met were everything. And I think we still have a great opportunity. So all you young people, members of APSA, stick with it. You never know where your science will take you. With that, thank you for the invitation.